It's like, I was ready, now I have to wait. Six, five, four, one live. Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to the channel. You're watching Ghost Girl Diaries podcast. Welcome to the new year. We finally made it out of 2020. Thank baby Jesus and black magic. Quite literally, it was so bad. Like, I feel like we just skated right through like the end. You know, it's actually funny because last night um, I called Kat. I think I was like, we were Snapchatting. And I, I did this snap filter, on, and it said, like, you have eight hours left till 2021. And then she snapped me again, <laughs> I snapped her back, and it was like, you have six hours left in 2021. I was like, doesn't it feel like time's going so slow? Like, what's going on? Like, can't we just, can we get this moving? Like, and then last night, she called me, like, right before midnight, well, about an hour before midnight, my time. 
She's like, God, like, I've been in 2021 for two hours. I'm like, I'm still not there yet. Like, I'm literally waiting to get there. I don't know what's going on. So anyway, um, welcome to the stream, guys. I'm going to bring in my co-host in one second. This is going to be um, a really big changer for the year. I'm coming back on podcasts every Friday, which is really exciting. I'm not only going to have Kat as my co-host, but since we lost a few other co-hosts um, in 2020, I'm going to be bringing in um, Elfie from Paranormal State. She'll be here a couple times a month, and I'm also having uh, Seth, our artist, fill in once in a while for a male perspective. He's actually very skeptical when it comes to things. I'm hoping eventually I can bring in a couple permanent people down the road, but we're not going to push it right now. We're just going to wait it out and, f and let the universe bring the right people to us. Um, so anyway, I'm going to bring in my co-host, Miss Kat Cormier. How are you, Miss Kat? I am doing so well. Thank goodness it's 2021. I know, right? How did you do <laughs> yeah. surviving uh, the new year? Uh, I did well. Yeah. I did well and I slept great. <laughs> so, you know, it's a great time. Out like a light. <laughs> Pretty much. 2021 hit and I'm like, all right, see you in the new year. <laughs> No. Bye. See you later. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. So let's back up for one second. So this topic we've been wanting to do because there was a documentary called The Devil's Road that was released last year on Travel Channel. We mm -hmm. watched it then. It is about the Warrens and the Warrens' legacy. Yeah. But then we were like, obviously, let's let's just get through this year because there's just some weird things. Everybody just needed to get through 2020 before we restarted this. So here we are, a couple days ago, Kat and I start comparing notes for the Warrens um, negotiations. Now also, if you guys remember, Kat has met Annabelle, like in person. And she has shared that horror story before. <laughs> horror story, yeah, that's um, exactly that, story. actually. Right, <laughs> so um, we had nightmares the other night <laughs> an incident an we incident. had an incident so I called Kat the next morning and I said I had the weirdest dream should I tell mine first or you want to tell yours first I mean I, I could I'll tell mine I'll okay. tell mine and then we'll go off of okay. it so yeah so essentially I don't know what it is about Annabelle but she likes to, you know, step in and create a little ruckus every time I see her in, like, a show. And, and mind you, in the documentary, she was only shown in, like, the last two to three minutes of the documentary. Not to give it away, but I gave it away. And um, that's how quick it is for her energy to, or, you know, its energy to take over and all of that. So um, that night, I had had on and off sleep all night. I was getting really hot really strange dreams had occurred but the one that was most vivid was of a little girl in a what looked like kind of like a dirty school dress she had um long brown hair and she had um, a ribbon in her hair that was like light blue to like put it back kind of like what my hairstyle is now which is creepy um <laughs> and she grabbed me by the hand and was showing me um different parts of this haunted location. So I was in this like house, this haunted house. And um, in it, she was showing certain people in my life that have, um, you know, th difficulties going on, you know, whether that be addictions or things like that. And she was pretty much telling me that um, that is why people are like possessed, I guess, um, was how it was portrayed to me in the dream. And that's why like, the shadow work aspect of our lives is really important because if you don't get control of like that darker side of you, something else will. Uh, and it was really weird. <laughs> that really freaked me out. And, um, I, you know, so I kept trying to wake myself up out of it. I ended up waking myself up saying the St. Michael prayer, uh, which was very new for me. I've never woken, haven't had to wake myself up out of a dream saying the St. Michael prayer. Uh, but yeah, that's ended up what, what happened. And I had to smoke bomb the entire apartment out <laughs> with, with Sage because the, her energy just lingered. It, it literally lingered all night. I got zero sleep into the next day. And it, it wasn't until after Crystal told me her dream that I was like, yeah. Yeah, this thing needs to be staged out. She needs to go. Very trancy energy. She has very, um, very dark, very compelling, like draws you in um, and very trancy, like puts you kind of in a trancy state. So 
that was my experience. I will, so this was the same night. We had the same, like, different dreams, the same girl. So I woke yeah. up the next morning. I called Kat. I said, but now at this point, I had no idea she'd had a nightmare about the same thing. So I said, I had this really weird dream. I had this dream. I was in a, I've been searching for a house for a while. I've been talking about that on social media. I've been manifesting a move. I've been looking at homes for a long time. I'm not going to move until I'm sure I found the right one that comes up on the market. I wasn't sure if it was going to happen in 2020 or not. So I've been looking at a lot of houses and properties and I had this nightmare where I was in a house with a realtor and my mother was there and one of my dogs was there and the realtor essentially like left the house and let my mom and I sort of start wandering through the property in this dream and I went over to where the kitchen sort of was and there was like a, a banister that went down into sort of like a basement or, or like a lower level area and I saw this figure start to walk up the stairs and in the dream I remember thinking I don't think anybody's down there I don't think anyone's supposed to be down there and this girl is walking up the stairs and she's sort of like Lottie hmm, humming you know sing hmm. well a cat does that like you know cat and I've like <laughs> lived together on and off because when she comes to Vegas she lives with me you know what I mean mm -hmm. so she walks around humming Lottie hmm. and so in the dream I'm thinking <laughs> Is, is it cat? You know what I mean? Like, is that cat? Like, and why the hell is she in the basement? Like, I didn't know you were here, girl. Like, why don't you say what's up? You just go downstairs, you know? Yeah. So she walks yeah. up and I realize she turns around and it's not cat. And it's this girl with sort of, I guess you could call it dirty brown, dirty blonde sort of hair. Like cat said, half up, half down, a sort of 1800s raggedy white nightgown. And it's definitely like female energy of maybe late teens, early 20s. Is that what you got? I guess we didn't compare ages. Yeah. About the same. Yeah. And she's singing and she's like projecting. And I'm like looking at this girl like she doesn't have Kat's exact voice, but like just the way she's presenting herself is like it reminds me of Kat. And I'm like, this is but this isn't Kat. And so the girl turns and she comes to us, this beautiful girl. And she's walking towards me, and I get this feeling in the dream where I'm like, something's not right. Something's not right. And I literally start walking backwards away from this girl. And I turn to my mother, and she's getting close quickly, and that's when I know something. Like, the energy was so, like, I want to say dank. I know, but it was so, like, it was almost like if you could smell something gnarly, that was how the energy felt. You know what I mean? And yeah. I just knew, like, she's portraying herself as this beautiful girl singing so that I trust her and she's not to be trusted. And so I back up. I turn to my mom and all, all I say is, Mom, I need you to start praying with me. And, and this is in the dream. And I literally sit up. Like, I, <laughs> I thought I was still asleep. <laughs> my spirit guides like pulled me out of that so fast like I sat up and I, I told Kat I was like I didn't know like where I was I was literally like how did I I've never just like sat up out of a dream like that normally when you wake up out of a dream or like a nightmare you're like oh I'm so out but I literally was like up and I called Kat and I was like dude like whatever that was was bad and Kat was like you're you're gonna shit when I tell you I just saw the same girl last night. And we both, now remember Cat's East Coast, I'm in Vegas, which is Pacific Standard Time, like LA time. And mm -hmm. we both woke up at 6 a.m. So technically, yeah. Cat's three hours ahead of me. She woke up at 6 a.m. And then three hours later, I woke up at 6 a.m. Neither of us could go back to sleep. And then when we went back to sleep, we crashed for hours because we just couldn't, it was just draining. So mm -hmm. anyway, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. So, <laughs> cat bombed her apartment. I didn't feel the need to do so, personally. I didn't feel like it was really in my house, but I do think it was definitely mimicking cat, for sure. Especially the, like, humming and the mm, singing thing was really creepy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think what creeped me out the most was when you told me it was singing almost what sounded like the national anthem. It did. Well, yeah. No. Uh, God bless America. To, yeah. God bless America. Yeah. Yeah, and I sang that a lot, like, early on in 
you know, when I used to sing a ton, I had those gigs all the time. Well, the, yeah, that's what I told Kat. I said, for, I said, for some reason, whatever this energy was, it was singing God Bless America. Like, and I was, and it was real dramatic. And I was like, yeah. is it because it's the new year, girl? Like, are you excited <laughs> for like 2021? And then I told <laughs> Kat and she was like, Crystal, I used to sing God Bless America, the national anthem at hockey games, right? Yep, for like five years in a row for this one specific hockey team. That was like my job, one of my jobs, like early on. It's messed up. So it's, yeah. it's uh, so Annabelle is definitely attached to Cat for sure, 100%. So um, long story is we were digging around um, with this documentary, okay? I'm going to say a couple of things first as like my own disclaimer because I like legal terms and it's fun. You know what I mean? <laughs> This is uh, just my opinion. There's my legal term. Um, the other legal term I have to state is everything I have researched, you can also research online. The documents that I found, you can access them online as well. They are court documents. Um, I have a feeling that if Tony Sparrow gets wind of this stream, he's going to be talking his little normal talk about people on social media. Here's the thing, like, you guys have known me for so many years I've been doing this. I like to dig and find the truth. I like to dig and find, I like to play devil's advocate, you know? Like, people have portrayed the Warrens as these, like, pedestal gods, in a sense, like, on this pedestal, which is fine if that's the case. But I found some really nitty gritty stuff out. In fact, Kat didn't even know what I found till this morning, and she was like, "Yeah, speechless." Yeah, I still am. I still am. It's gonna blow everyone's mind. Yeah, I'm gonna upset some people who are like hardcore Warren fans. Um, believe it or not, I mean, go search the documents on the court court documents yourself. It's obviously if I was able to dig and find them you're able to dig and find them. And I just, it was so many documents, I couldn't even go through all of them, to be honest. <clears throat> so before we get into the dirt, which is like the good stuff, let's, um, I have notes here. I'm going to pull them up really quickly. So we both took some separate notes on the actual documentary itself. If you haven't seen it, it is accessible on Amazon as well. <clears throat> I paid like $1.99 to buy the video or something. Um, and it's The Devil's Road, um, The Warren's Legacy. So let's just start off by talking about, from a filmmaker standpoint, the first thing they say is like really like legit stuff. Ed was a demonologist and Lorraine was a clairvoyant. Those were the first two sentences. And I'm like, wow, those are some like massive claims coming through, you know? Now, once again... I don't like the word demonologist because I think that Pete, anybody could technically be a demonologist if you want to <clears> study <throat> demonology. But to me, a true, true demonologist is like a very holy person. And if that person is a demonologist, I don't think they're going to call themselves a demonologist. They're going to probably call themselves a priest or uh, what, what's the other terms for it? That's uh, fathers. Like yeah. Father Christian, fathers, um, bishops, bishops, yeah, like we've, we've, some we've deacons too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. those people to me are actual demonologists, in my opinion. Um, I I also think when people like pull out a book and say, "Oh, I'm going to study demonology," I think that they're going to start bringing that stuff towards them, and I think that's where it like gets really dangerous, and you're kind of dabbling in the dark. So, um, when you challenge, this is another quote that, that literally like the third sentence, when you challenge the demonic, it waits until you are most vulnerable. And then it starts opening to the case of the conjuring house. So what was your intake like on the rhetoric of like the opening uh, scene of, of these like dramatic claims of Ed and Lorraine? I mean, it, it doesn't Laura shock for me. The bits. Thank you. Oh, hey. Um, oh, I just see it now. Um, yeah, I, I'm i not shocked that they would put it in there. I mean, considering the franchise that they created, mm -hmm. um, you know, through their uh, investigations and things like that, it, obviously they're going to 
you know, started off with that, right. you know, the money makers of everything in the movies and mm -hmm. and everything else. But yeah, they had, and, and one of the opening scenes too was of about the Conjuring movie franchise. Now, Literally, the Conjuring like, house is in Rhode Island. Have you ever been like there or over there? I have been to that part of Rhode Island. Yes, mm -hmm. that's um, in Harrisville, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And um, it was purchased by new owners uh, 2019. We're not in yeah, 2020 I, oh, I have some 19. tea on that too, girl. Okay. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait. Oh, yeah. Can't that wait. was an interesting read. So there's, um, it's like this like gritty old like gray farmhouse that's like falling apart. And these two <clears throat> okay you, when you first find it these people that like bought the conjuring house it's like this younger couple probably 36 ish 35 ish thank mm -hmm. you Nik uh, nikita appreciate you for the bit yes um so <laughs> i'm laughing because they portray <laughs> as like oh we accidentally bought the conjuring house didn't know what it was and so we have decided to turn it into a bed and breakfast then you do more research on the guy and he's been a ghost hunter for 10 years he's well aware what he has just purchased he's well aware that it's gonna be a money maker i mean i'll stay there you know what I mean? Not only to film, but if it's on Airbnb, hell yeah, call me. I'll be right there. You know, I'll pay 400 bucks a night. Like, yeah. But, um, yeah, so the tea on that is just, like, they try to be like, oh, we didn't know. And we just decided, like, we should make this available for everybody. No, ho. You knew what you were buying. And you know it's going to be a moneymaker, which is fine. But just be honest about it. You know what I mean? That's so, true. I, but I didn't realize it, it's really, like... It needs some Jesus. Like, that house needs, like, a lot of Jesus. Like, it's, it's, like, looks like it's about to fall over. Like, it looks like a house made out of Lincoln Logs, doesn't it? It's so funny because I was watching, like, looking at the photo of the new owners and things. Because they did, like, a whole article about it. I know. It in, uh, oh, my God. It's 2019. so bad. It's so bad. It was well, I was laughing because I'm like, this house, first off, looks like it has, like, asbestos from hell, <laughs> all right? Okay, and then like, these owners are sitting there and they're just like, I'm so happy. I know. I know. I know. Can like, you imagine how much it's going to cost to get that, like, renovations up and up to code? Like, it looks old. Yeah, it needs some Jesus real Woo! bad. Yeah. Real bad. Corey I'm and Paris Jennifer Bill Heinzen. H-E-I-N-Z-E-N, if you're curious about it. So, yeah, um... June of 2019 is when they purchased it. I, I didn't really look into how much they purchased it for, but um, it does say, like, that they, like, bought the house and that you still hear a lot of, like, paranormal activity. Like, they have doors open and closed by themselves, footsteps and knocks, you'll go to the door, the handles jiggle, stuff like that. So it's still haunted, um, mm -hmm. which we'll get to the Conjuring case soon because I have... Here's Kat and I tea. have some opinions on a lot of this. I have a lot of opinions. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Kat's going to be the more, like, gentle one. I'm going to be the one more, like, in your face. Because I like to be that like person. It's like the good cop, bad cop. I like it's a nice to mixture. be that person, though. You know what I mean? Like, I like to shock people. And they're like, what? Um, <laughs> it's like when they're like, oh, you're blonde and, like, girly. And you're like, yeah, I'm, you know, I like dead people. Like, what? You know, like, <laughs> Okay, so um, let's talk about, um, I'm going down, I'm reading this article, it's just ridiculous about, um, they tried to make it look like they were buying it to be nice or whatever, and like, um, okay, Save so it. the main the main houses that they're known for, obviously, the Conjuring, <clears throat> the Bridgeport Poltergeist, which was haunting yes. in Connecticut, essentially, right? It's a haunting in Connecticut, that one. Pretty much. I think that was actually a separate one. Well, it is, but, like, that was where the media was all over it, wasn't it? Like, the media was everywhere, and there were cars yeah. going by. And yeah, because that was, that was in, I was 1970s, yeah, like, 1974. Something like that, yeah. I something like so. that. And it was around that time that The Exorcist had just been released. Right. Um, in movie theaters, so people were like, oh, my God. So, in other words. It's happening divine timing yeah right it's true what would, better time to raise awareness would, would the warrens have been as successful 
if the exorcist had not just dropped. That's true. Yeah, that's very strange how that all kind of ended up working out I don't in their think favor. Because so. there were literally, like, and it? I mean, who hasn't seen The Exorcist? We've all seen The Exorcist. Honestly, it's, true. I'm not as repulsed by The Exorcist as I am the fact that they had, like, pea green soup. Because I think pea soup is disgusting. Right. And the fact that, like, she said that she, Linda Blair had said she ate so much pea green soup because she'd had to, like, throw it up. Just the thought of eating pea soup, it just makes me nauseous. Not the fact that she was, like, gagging it up. Just as, <laughs> I would be, too, personally, you know what I mean? But, like, yeah, no. but there were Ugh. people running out of the theater when The Exorcist happened because it was so scary. Um, yeah. God, what's it like to be in a movie theater? I don't know. It's been so long. It's kind of sad. It's kind of sad. It's been almost a year. Like, literally sick. Anyway, sorry, I had a PTSD flashback from 2020. <laughs> okay, let's oh, move, move forward to Amityville. They were known from the Lux family, which I'm going to talk about that because I'm lucky enough to know um, Chris Lutz, who is the youngest son. I, I He's a beautiful human. I've talked about his story before. But mm -hmm. it's interesting. So the very first interviewer or interviewee, whatever you want to you want to title him, is Jason Hawes from Ghost Hunters. Did you see that? What's that? Jason Hawes from Ghost Hunters. Oh yeah. He's like Ed and Lorraine are groundbreaking. I kind of thought it was random to have him in there. I thought I'm it not was gonna so lie. Uh -huh. I was like, why is it Jason? <laughs> I was like, like literally. but you're a skeptic, boo. Like, you think it's electrical issues. Like, you just... It's, it's true. It's the true. fan made a yeah. fart noise. It wasn't the ghost. It was the fan. It was a pipe. It was a pipe. <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was a squeaky pipe. Um, oh, then, okay, Jesus so please. should I should I start dipping into my little... Are we ready for some tea? Why, why I think I we sit need to back? Dip. I'm sitting back. We, like, what? Go ahead. We need to dip the toe in the tea. You know what I'm saying? We just I'm get just going to lightly dip the tea. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then just, just let's jump. Let's just start little increments. Oh, can I add something quickly Please before you do. jump in? Please do. I thought it was really interesting that Ed and Lorraine went to a house in Henniker, New Hampshire, um, which is, like, not that far from where I live, and it was called the Ocean Born Mary House. Right. I wrote that down because I was going to yeah. ask you, have you been by it or seen it? No, but I'm going to now. Like, I'm liter I'm genuinely thinking it. about taking a drive next week and just driving by it to Do see because the address is on there. Mm -hmm. um, but there was, like, some major activity in there. Okay, like, with that, guys, like, well, I don't want to get ahead, but with that one, too – so that was like the first haunted house they'd been to because they went on like a New England road trip, right? Is basically what Ed said. They mm -hmm. randomly found this like haunted publicized house. They went to this haunted publicized house and the owner like let them in and like opened the door and like talked to him. And then they were sitting at like the kitchen table and they said that Lorraine tranced out. And it was the first time she'd ever tranced out. Ed was like freaking out saying like, what's wrong with my wife? Something going on. <clears throat> And the guy was very knowledgeable in paranormal. And the guy said, oh, I've seen that happen with other people who have, like, psychic abilities. <laughs> and um, Ed was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, people that are clairvoyant come in here and they do that all the time. And he here's, you know, the whole thing where I say Ed was an opportunist. I think he was a little bit of a con guy. With that yeah. being said... That was when Lorraine started using the term clairvoyant. Hmm. So it was only after that guy at that location gave her the title. She was probably using the term like psychic or I'm seeing colors and auras and blah, blah, blah. Which I'm not, I'm not saying she wasn't gifted. I think she was gifted. But I just find it interesting that that was how they started marketing themselves was... She's a clairvoyant, all because this guy was knowledgeable on it that they went to one random haunted house. I I have some things to go off of that at some point. Okay. We won't do it now, but I, I wrote down a note to talk about that because I just, I have something in regards to her being clairvoyant. There's so a lot of like little it. red flags we found in here is all I'm saying. Okay, so I want to start yeah. with saying... I'm sitting here watching this and I'm they're talking about like the conjuring movie and the conjuring box office and like how wildly successful it was and I'm in film. Ah, right? <laughs> yes. I'm laughing because I just know 
that's how Crystal it's works. You know what I'm saying? I just know. Contracts. You know what I mean? She's very thorough, guys. She's very thorough. In a past life, I should have been a lawyer. You okay. probably were. Probably was. Maybe maybe <laughs> there's still time. You know what I mean? Like, just go do it. Just go get done. Hey, it's true. Okay. I have numbers. I'm about to drop some facts, so everybody pay attention. Hold on tight. Conjuring box office for one movie made $319.5 million for one movie. The entire series of The Conjuring, which is the multiple films, made close to $1 billion. Did you hear that correctly? Wow. That's a lot of effing money. Okay. So all I'm saying is, why hasn't Ghost Girl Diaries gotten signed? No, I'm just kidding. What I'm trying to say is... No, but really, though. No, but But really. really. If, if, (laughs) If Paranormal is that desired, okay... And that successful, there is room, okay? Anyway. Mm-hmm. The co- okay, so let's back up. The Conjuring, the first movie, made $319.5 million, okay? So then I said, okay, wait, you, you know, people see that money and they're like, oh my God, that's so much money. Okay, but how much did it cost to create the film? Because making a feature film is ridiculously expensive. Obviously, Warner Brothers was behind it. They have money. For the first yeah. film, one film only, it cost one hundred and sixty-one point seven million dollars. So you do the math, and that's like half of what they made. So like, they're just happy they got back what they put out, right? Because that's like what the actors cost, and all like how much it costs for the director. Obviously, usually the director will be the highest paid, and then the major actors will be underneath that. Then you have like camera techs and producers and all this stuff. Okay. So mm-hmm. then I was like, I'm going to look up the director. The director is James Wan. Okay, he obviously made some money off of this because his net worth is $70 million. And by the way, wow. when you look up someone's net worth online, it's definitely lowballing. It's definitely lowballing because you don't know what their assets are. You don't know what properties they own. Usually millionaires or people that have a lot of money are investors. I'm an investor. If you're investing in the stock market, if you're investing in other businesses. So really saying he's he's worth the director from The Conjuring is worth $70 million, That's low ball in it, okay? But he made a lot of money off this film. Then I was like, you know, screw the actors. We know the actors are going to get paid. They have to get paid because they're the ones that are the face of it. So we know they're going to get paid well. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to look up how much Lorraine Warren was worth when she was died. Do you know what I found? $1.7 million. Hmm. The Conjuring series, $1 billion. And that poor little old lady was worth $1.7 million. That is pennies to what the series of The Conjuring made. So mm-hmm. that tells me she didn't have a good lawyer. She didn't know what she was doing with filming contracts, and that's sad. But that was probably a lot of money for her, right? Yeah. She's yeah. been pretty much a housewife. They did, like, random stuff, like, you know, locally. They never really charged. But they had to eat somehow. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then Ed dies, and she gets this opportunity, and she's like, well, I'm going to do it, you know? So... Mm-hmm. Making two million off of a billion dollars is ridiculous. Production companies yeah. screwed her, and that's just sad. Period. Okay. Anyway, poor Lorraine. Do I start this? Do I start dipping the toe? I think the ankle needs to go in now. You know what I'm saying? Like I think it's just the time. An- yeah. Okay. So we got the toe in. Now we're going with the, the ankle. Toe, now the ankle needs to just you know. Go this in is the gonna water. be a dark hole, okay? Because this is it's... not where this this was meant to go. <laughs> not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. But but the yeah. irony of the title of this is like the Warrens' legacy. Yeah, right? like or the true is, story the or something. Again? What's the title now? I feel like it I'm was. Gonna... It. Hang on, let me pull it up. Devil's Road: The True Story of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Yeah, the true story. Is it the true story though? But that's the key. That's I the may ankle. I found the true story. <laughs> okay, we're going in with the ankle now, okay, folks. Okay, Kat's like, just put the ankle in. Okay. I'm ready. <laughs> God, this is so yeah. crazy. Okay, so I was literally just 
researching the cost of the film, what everybody's making, net worth. Like, in my opinion, Lorraine should have been worth at least a hundred million dollars. In my opinion. Way more. Minimally. Way more. Like that's minimally. You're you're made a billion dollars off of this woman and what she did, and you paid her pennies. I have a question. Did we check at Ed's um, net worth? I think it's combined. Is it combined? Well, because her net worth, he's already dead. You know what I mean? That's true. He's That's already true. dead. So, I mean, unless he's got something stashed somewhere that nobody knew about, like, waiting, hanging out. Uh, and remember, yeah. the films weren't done after he died, so I doubt he was worth more than that, for sure. That's true. Okay, so as I'm researching, okay, oh, my God, I don't even know how this happened. So I'm researching it. So... I find out that there is, let me find, I want to give you the, the receipts, okay? His name is Gerald Brittle, B-R-I-T-T-L-E, okay? In 2016, Mr. Gerald sued Warner Brothers for $999 million because he was the co-writer of several books with the Warrens in the 70s and 80s. He was the ghost writer, basically, of the books that the Warrens put out, such as, like, there was one called Demonology. There's a few. There's a few of them. Basically, Gerald said, I am the author of these books that were, like, The Conjuring and all this stuff. And we had a specific NDA. Nobody came to me before the negotiation started for the movies in the contract in NDA I said you could not do any other like further publishing without my permission because I was the writer of these books and he had a specific contract with the Warrens well I don't know if it's because Lorraine is older did she forget about the contracts who knows what happened maybe mm -hmm. Ed did it behind her back, and she didn't know about the contracts. We don't know. So essentially, this author, Gerald, takes Warner Brothers to court. He says, I want $999 million in reimbursement because essentially you copyrighted my content out of my books without my permission. He was really wanting, let's just say he wanted a piece of the pie. Of course he did. One billion dollars? Of course he wanted a piece of the pie. Everybody's greedy. Right. Everybody's got to eat when you're on this planet. You got to have shelter. So he wanted a piece of the pie. He sues Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers says, okay, we're not going to worry too much about it um, unless the judge takes it serious. So when you're talking about a copyright infringement in Hollywood, how it works is um, you take the stuff to court. Then it goes to the judge, and the judge determines if it should go through court proceedings or if it should be thrown out. It just depends on how much evidentiary support there is. It, it depends on a lot of things, right? So this guy told the judge, if Warner Brothers can determine that ghosts are real, I will drop my case. Otherwise, in the court of law, ghosts are not real and they do not exist. Therefore, I wrote fictional books with the Warrens and they took my fictional stories and reportrayed them in movies and now they owe me money. <laughs> Did your head just explode? Yeah. Everywhere. He, he won. He won. Warner Brothers settled with him out of court for an undisclosed amount of money. I can tell you it was a lot of effing money. In fact, that author is richer now than Lorraine herself, which also makes me effing sick, considering she was at the core of this whole thing. But anyway, he knew how to screw wow. the system. It gets deeper than that. I think we should come back to that, though. I think we should just... You think? Yeah, I think we should come back okay. to that. Because the next part that I tell you guys is going to be, that's going to be when we jump in the shit pool. You know what I mean? Like, we're about wasting right now. So let's just we're get waiting comfortable. It out. Let's get comfortable first. Waiting it out. Then we'll go ahead and dive. You know what I'm saying? Okay, Kat, yeah. you want to take over from there? Okay. Um, going back to the documentary, right? 
Yes. Sorry. Which part you want to go back to? Okay. Um, yeah. So the opening scene we talked about earlier um, was talking about like the Conjured movie franchise and all of that. So it kind of opened up to um, 966 Lind- Lind- Lindley Street, Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, where there was like poltergeist activity happening there. Mm-hmm. Yada, yada, yada. Um, essentially chairs were moving refrigerators were being thrown ice box were being thrown um knives were being thrown and they interviewed uh, the police what would that happen today in 2021 no 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 not at all and there was a crucifix that was on the wall that literally just like shattered mm-hmm. like nothing was there and it just shattered so at that point, a house blessing was asked for, and everything went fine during this house blessing by uh, a father, priest, um, until the, they reached the basement. Mm-hmm. The father had stated in his interview, which was all on um, tapes, so they had like some unreleased footage and like unreleased tapes and things like that of some of these interviews, um, you know, with Ed and Lorraine and, and the folks that they were with. And he said that as he was blessing the basement, he kept seeing this. Um, shadow this black shadow and he said that the shadow looked solid and very well defined Mm -hmm. so i thought that that was really interesting to hear that it just literally looked like a a being but it was just like solid black like you couldn't even look through it Mm -hmm. at all um father's seminary so that's like the father's trainee so that's uh, that would be like kind of like a deacon someone that was training with the father to become an exorcist or things like that um was 21 years old he was an assistant he was upstairs and that's when he started to witness that lorraine was under attack from this shadow this was kind of like one of her first attacks in a documented um paranormal investigation with ed and lorraine um she said on the unreleased tapes that it felt like she was being burned Mm -hmm. like on the inside so that was like very very eerie that was a very very eerie thing to say yeah yeah um the child was the one that was uh the main mainly the affected one Mm -hmm. in the home wasn't Um, the adopted kid he was adopted yeah, really sad, really, really sad. Um, he so there was this man named Paul Eno. What's his name? Mm-hmm. I think he. I can't remember the direct relation with Ed and Lorraine, but I think he was someone that worked with Ed, Ed and Lorraine. Um, and he was watching the child because they what there was um, suspicions that it, the entity was affecting the child. So while Ed and Lorraine were walking through the home with the priest the uh paul was sitting with the child at a table and and the child was playing a board game um he said that he looked over at the child and he started to smell something kind of like sulfur sulfur smelling he 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 mentioned in it that it smelled kind of like an ozone layer so i would assume maybe something like smoky and like not smelling good Mm -hmm. and that this entity was showing itself as this white mist but what was strange about it was when paul went to go and touch it he said that it it moved, pushed him back. Like, it literally felt like there was somebody there, like, pushing his hand back. And he said he felt that the mist had a bone structure. Mm-hmm. So, like, he could touch this mist and it felt like it actually had bones. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was weird to me. Like, that was kind of, that could give me goosebumps a little bit. Because, you know, you think about, you know, entities and spirits and things like that. You wouldn't necessarily think of something that has some form of, like, a bone structure. But then again, we can't see it. Right. You know, um, Joseph Walsh at that point um, was shown he's a police chief and he said, um, you know, he, he had a really big issue with the uh, things and the way that the media was broadcasting this town. Bridgeport, mm-hmm. Connecticut is a relatively small town. And, you know, with small towns, they have to hold a certain type of like, uh, what's that word, like view, like vantage point about, you know, their good town and nothing bad can happen here and things like that. And um, some time had passed and the investigation never really like fully uh, came to a close. Mm -hmm. And he came forward on the media and said that the girl admitted that she was the one hitting the walls and creating this paranormal activity, which um, at that point really made no sense because how could like 
a 95 pound girl soaking wet 10 years old move a 450 pound ice box mm -hmm. like that that literally makes no sense to me well, whatsoever to or to anybody up, essentially they had to cover it up of course like mm -hmm. they were just sick of the media because mm -hmm. at that point the exorcist had just been released so everybody was there everyone was taking photos media divine was constantly in it man i'm telling you divine timing yeah really weird it was then after um joseph walsh came on that tony Sparrow was um you know aired um and was talking about lorraine and her being able to see auras and lights and things like that and how um she grew up in a very uh catholic religion mm -hmm. and she was in catholic school when she was younger and she would talk about these things with the nuns there and um the nuns would tell her all the time we don't talk about that here i know and they pretty much just swept it under the rug, so and that I made me really sad. I think seeing orbs and auras, don't you? Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. And she would be able to see um, entities and see, like, the color, like, like what it looked like, mm -hmm. like, what they look like as a spirit. And um, it was just, it's made me really sad. That made me really sad. And I think that they showed Tony in the interview. That was the first time we saw Tony Sparrow in the interview. Um, and, of course, they would show him after talking about the police chief because Tony himself was um, a police officer back mm -hmm. in the day. Um, and then he went on talking about Ed and about how he fought in the Navy during World War II. And he had had a near-death experience, oh, which is what there. kind of got him I got some in the paranormal. I got oh, some. yeah. Okay, go. Go, go. Tea. Okay. One thing that really stood out to me was the daughter – Judy mm -hmm. said, quote, their true mission was to prove the devil existed and that he was real. Yes. Then I was like, what's my mission with Ghost Girl Diaries? I like to talk <laughs> to dead people. Right. <laughs> I, was I like, know. Shoot. That's, I, mine doesn't well, sound as good. I, don't, I like to talk to the devil. Should I reword it? But I don't like to talk to the devil. You know what I mean? Annabelle well, visits me in my dreams. That's my mission. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I mean, you get insight from it at some point, you know, <laughs> feelings. It's an experience. That's right. the whole point of being a paranormal investigator is to push those boundaries, mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, that we had talked about that, too, about what she had said. And they had talked about it a few times throughout the whole documentary. The documentary runs like about an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. It's like an hour 20, hour and a half or something. And um, the, the main thing that they kept saying and repeating was that Ed, the whole point why Ed and Lorraine were doing this was to show people that there was a God and there is evil and the devil exists and to not use Ouija boards and to not do like seances and yada yada. Mm -hmm. um, but then that kind of went down like a little bit of a rabbit hole where I, I was talking to Crystal and I'm like, but isn't that like the point of being a paranormal investigator? Mm -hmm. You know, like we can't stop anybody from doing that, you know? Well, essentially so, yeah, what, what Kat's saying is like Ed and, and Lorraine were trying to show people like this is dangerous. It's the devil. The devil exists. Don't mess with this stuff. But my response was, of course, you're, everyone that's in the public eye is going to have admirers. You can't tell people or stop them from following in your footsteps and like Kat said they can't be the only paranormal investigators that ever existed period and, right. and honestly I'm gonna be honest Tony Sparrow has that arrogant ass attitude too of yeah I have Annabelle she's dangerous you don't know how dangerous she is you're not gonna get around her and you don't know what you're messing with well you yeah. don't have the liberty to tell me how far I can push my boundaries with interacting on the other side. You don't rule all paranormal investigators, Tony, and Ed, for that matter, right? Right. We all, yeah. as paranormal investigators, have our... I'm not saying it's safe to mess around with demons and demonology either, but I'm not telling you not to do... you got to do you, boo. Free will. Because you're going to be the one that finds out the consequences. It's not going to be anybody else. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's nice to warn them, but, you know... Why was Ed so obsessed with, like, demons and, like, proving the devil was real? Yeah. I yeah. might have that answer. She might. Yeah. Tony's, a, Tony's an interesting guy, too, because I had, I had um, had some uh, conversations that was, with him. That was so polite, Kat. Tony is such well, an interesting guy. He... He's an interesting... And I say character because the, his facade that he puts on in front of people is not how he talks to people 
like behind the scenes, uh-huh. if that makes sense. Like, like I call him an interesting character because he's very, um, his, his energy right when you see him is very kind of like angry, I guess, in a sense. Like if you're an empath and you read energy off of people, he seems very um, cut and dry and very just like an angry dude. Mm-hmm. He's a very, very powerful, like angry dude. And he knows that his words with people that aren't informed of this stuff or maybe aren't as involved in the paranormal will believe him you and everything that he says. Um, Nikita's asking, if you, do you think if you see Annabelle in person that her energy will follow you home? Ooh, you cut out. What did you say, Crystal? Great. <laughs> what did you say? If I see Annabelle what? I hate her. Oh, wait. I just saw her question. Her energy will follow you home. Uh, Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> oh, yeah. it's it's kind of weird. I I talked about my experiences with Annabelle with Crystal, and I've I've talked about it on my YouTube channel too. Um, but her her energy, I feel like she wants to get out so badly out of the encasing that she's in that she will attach herself or her energy onto as many people as possible to like make that happen. If that makes sense. Well, it causes an energetic highway, you know, like that's yeah. the exit out is like going to you or projecting. I mean, I'm going to be honest and say, I don't think that that case does a whole lot. Blessed or not. I think that she enjoys the vessel she's chosen to be in permanently. Yeah. Because where else is she going to go? You know what I mean? And I also think that she likes the facade now. You know, the law of attraction works both ways, guys. You can bring in the energy of like, oh, I want to be positive. I want money. Like the law of attraction works. There were CIA documents just released recently that the government talks about the law of attraction. And sometimes that's how they use media agendas to push out onto us. If they get enough people, I mean, even like the the Rona issue, if you get enough people believing in it, it's going to make the fear grow and it's going to mm-hmm. make the, the actual infection grow. And Annabelle's yeah. the same way. If there's enough people believing in her and you have a billion dollars created at the box office surrounding the creation of Annabelle, everyone that's put money into it by going to the theater or believing it, or even Kat and I talking about Tony Sparrow and her, that's giving her more power and more energy and making her bigger and more powerful. She's not going to leave that vessel now because she knows she's important. Yeah, she, I, I like, the best way I can describe it, too, is kind of like what Crystal has talked about in the past about um, Saks Museum and how those entities really feel, like, comfortable in those rooms. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they love that room, and I think that Annabelle loves the vessel that she's chosen. Mm-hmm. I do, I do believe that, but I don't doubt for a second that you shouldn't, you know, I, she's very dark. She's very, very dark, and, you know, in, in the event, just to quickly, I won't go crazy long talking about it, but they had her in the room the whole time along with the conjuring mirror as well from the conjuring case. So they had the conjuring mirror in the same room as well. And um, I think that's just kind of like what amped it up, you know, the two very dark energies. don't you energies. think that once again, now that it's been believed in by all these people and everybody's bought into it, that it's made it even more powerful than it was before? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't doubt that for one second. Mm-hmm. I don't doubt that for one second. Yeah. Because it's, it's... here's my opinion on Ed Gein. I'm going to use my example with Ed Gein. <clears throat> Every time I go to the museum, I get followed by home by Ed Gein. Mm-hmm. Now, remember, he's just as famous in a way. They made the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Psycho. I mean, like, he's famous. Like, he's proud of himself. Like, what he's created, he's made. But Ugh. he follows me home. Like, cats had nightmares of him after she went to the museum. She had an experience. I'm not mm-hmm. afraid of him, though, because I just think he was a really misunderstood lost soul. I really don't think he was, quote, as dark as he was. I think maybe he suffered from mental illness. I'm not giving him an excuse for the, the murders and the things that he did. But, like, he was building a suit to recreate his mother. I think he was afraid to be alone. So he was, like, creating, like, an alternate personality by building a human suit. And I just, I'm, I look at things on a psychological perspective, and I think that's where energies, I interact with them differently. I mm-hmm. don't see him as Ed Gein, the, like, serial killer. I'm like, dude, you were messed up. You needed some therapy. You needed some holy water, a little bit of Jesus, and we would have had you on the right track instead of <laughs> grave robbing, brother. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, I just look at things differently. So when he follows me home, I know it sounds bad, but I'm not really scared. He can't stay here. 
you can't stay here, Mr. Gein. But, like, mm-hmm. I'm just not afraid of that energy. And the same thing sort of went with I had that dream about Annabelle. All I knew was I wasn't going to be around it. And I literally backed up and my guides got me out of the dream immediately. So I was in, I was in, I have like a new group for Ghost Girl Diaries on Facebook and people talk about like getting followed home and people like, oh, I'd love to like investigate, but I'm too scared to get followed home. In my, my, but I've also been doing it for freaking how long? Half my life. (laughs) I get followed home 99.99% of the time. So now not everyone does. Kat hasn't always gotten followed home. She also has a, a definitely um, a, a wider light to her, if you will, where I'm kind of neutral. I like a little bit of, okay, I like the dark. I like the dark. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm interested on the dark side. Okay. I can't lie about it. Not That yeah. doesn't mean I'm a devil worshiper. I'm not into Satanism. It just means I'm interested in understanding both sides of it. I'm under- mm-hmm. I do. Ha- and if these people are so afraid, like you go in the conjuring house, like they're talking about, and there's still activity going on. I want to experience it. I want to know why is it so scary? Why is it so scary? Is it really that scary? Or are people just making it out to be bigger than it actually is? Now, definitely with energies, I think good versus bad. There's, there's quite a difference. There's quite a difference. Mm. There's quite a difference yeah. between hanging out with a demon and hanging out with just a dead person that doesn't want to cross over, right, Kat? Like, yeah, it's true, very true. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I want to go on to um, the next part, which is probably going to be dropping the mic on Ed Ed Warren. Uh, conjuring. With what? Yeah. With the conjuring. Yep. Okay. Devil's um, Road: The True Story of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Now remember this title: The True Story of. Ed and Lorraine Warren. Mm-hmm. As I'm researching the co- ready to jump in the, the ship pool with me? Is everybody ready? So now we're, we're, we're going, we're jumping in. We're all comfortable, right? We're ready to go. We're waiting. Okay. Because yes. this is definitely a shit pool. So I'm just letting everybody know ahead of time. As I'm researching, like, how much the conjuring made and all that stuff, I'm like, okay, cool. I want to, I want to find out more information. I find out that. The author, which is this Gerald guy, he is suing Warner Brothers, trying to get more money out of Warner Brothers because he's saying, like, I created, you know, the story of the conjuring and the demonologist, right? And I'm going to get um, compensated for it. And at the time, they're kind of, this, this court case went on for a few years, like 2016, 17, 18-ish, okay? So they're going back and forth fighting, and Gerald gets dirty, Okay. First of all, he brings out a producer that was from the Conjuring movies. Now, this is that guy. What was his name? He's the guy that Zach had a problem with, with um, the Demon House. Do you remember that whole saga that happened, like, in the Demon House? Was it Jay? I have his uh, name. Jason? Um, no, I have it began name. with a J, didn't it? Mm, Am I losing it? Hang on a second. We were literally just talking about him. Yep. I want to give his name because I want it to be correct. Um, I took snapshots of stuff, and I will post this for you guys. Tony DeRosa. Remember Tony DeRosa? Yeah. He is a producer from the original Conjuring. So Tony and Gerald, who's the author. Tony's a producer, and Gerald's the author. They get together, <clears throat> and they decide they're going to team tag Warner Brothers and get money out of them. And how they're going to do it is they're going to play dirty. And what they do, and once again, find these documents online. Find find the court case online. Do your work, boo. It's going to mm-hmm. take you a long time. What? What? Uh-oh. There's scratching in here. I and can hear it. In when back. I said "do your work, boo," I heard a female go, "Mm-hmm." <laughs> oh my gosh! Which before I started this stream, guys, Kat and I were sitting here prepping like audio and like lighting, and all of a sudden the door to my studio opened, and it shut by itself. And I was like, "Who the hell just walked in my studio?" I went over there, nobody's there. So Kat was like, "Oh, good, Annabelle's right on time." 
Um, now I'm going to have to. And then I heard footsteps. And Kat was hearing footsteps on hardwood floors, which I have carpet. Anyway, Annabelle must agree with this. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, oh so, gosh. <laughs> so Tony, the producer, they're going to tag team Warner Brothers, okay? And they're going to sue Warner Brothers. And how they're going to do it is the author, Gerald, pulls out his original old contracts from the Warrens in, like, the 70s and 80s when they made these books. And in the contracts, it talks about a woman named Judith Penny. And the woman in these old... And they're all submitted to the courts. And they're saying that if Warner Brothers does not give them money and close the case, they're basically going to expose the Warrens to the world... And um, they're going to, like, shut everything down that they've created, this, like, billion-dollar empire. So that is when Warner Brothers stepped in and was like, we're going to pay you off and shut you up so that you don't screw up anything else that we're going to try to build again. Oof, this is where it gets not what good. The hell? There is a little girl, it sounds like, in here. Like, really? Like, like, it sounds like maybe 12 or something. Oh, great. Like, it sounds like she's, like, giggling and playing in here. Like, behind, like, my backdrop. Just let me, just give me one second. I just want to. I'm just saying, I smoke bomb my house, you can't come back. <laughs> got to say about that. I don't hear Nikita. Nikita. Oh, Nikita's talking about the um, Lizzie Borden house. They're selling it again. Got Nikita. Okay, Moon. so they find this girl named Judith Penny, and they have documents on her. Judith Penny was a 15-year-old girl when she met Ed Warren at the age of, he was 37. He started having an affair with Judith Penny. He was a bus driver. And Judith Penny took the bus to school. She obviously had a troubled home life. And at some point, Ed Warren invited Judith Penny to live with them. There were a lot of people that were questioning this in the neighborhood. And a few days after Judith moved in, she was actually arrested at the age of 15, being accused of adultery of basically sleeping with Ed. They couldn't figure out why she was there. <laughs> the police ended up letting her go. There were a few stories going on. The Warrens lied and said she was a niece. There was another story that li they lied and said that she was a Catholic kid that they were bringing in that was like a homeless child they were helping. And then there was another story that she was basically the babysitter and the house sitter for when they were out of town working on paranormal cases. What yeah. happened, what this author had was documents that Ed was a pedophile and he was sleeping with Judith Penny and she actually lived with the Warrens for 40 years. She lived with them from 19, 1963 when she met him at 15 and she moved out in 2003, okay? She also accused Ed of being a pedophile. So eventually what ends up happening is Judith gets pulled into this court case. Not the daughter Judith. The girl that was 15 that moved in with them. Okay? So Penny. she has to hire a lawyer. And once again, find the documents if you want to. She hires a lawyer to represent her with this Warner Brothers case saying, I don't want to be pulled in this. But they still needed a statement from her for the court system. And essentially, Judith Penny stated that, yes, at 15 in 1963, I moved in with Ed and Lorraine Warren. I was Ed's girlfriend. He is a pedophile. I lived with him for 40 years. Um, Lorraine Warren was essentially a, a really good Catholic woman who didn't like sex, and Ed didn't like that. So, essentially, they moved this 15-year-old girl in not only to, quote, help her, but also she was helping raise their child and also watching the house 
while they were gone. Now, take a step back for a minute and remember, I think it was the second Annabelle movie. Do you remember there being a babysitter in the movie? But she wasn't related and it was an underage kid? Is everybody shitting themselves right now? Yeah, this... And it, it only keeps going. Oh, it's it only not, keeps going. We're not done yet. We're not well, done this, yet. All of this is on documents. This is all documented. It's all, it's documented. all documented. So, so then yeah. what ends up happening is this whole court case starts to unfold and Lorraine gets her lawyer involved and says, we need to get an affidavit to Warner Brothers immediately because, like, the truth is coming out, okay? <clears throat> so her lawyers drop an affidavit for the production company sign. What's an affidavit? It's like a, a legal document that they're going to be in agreement upon something. It could be considered an addendum to a contract, which is like an extension to the contract. Inside of the addendum, it says... You know, I'm going to read it verbatim. I'm gonna Receipts. I'm going to read it verbatim because I, I took screenshots. So just hang on. Give me a second to find which one it is. Oh, by the way, here's the girl at 15 with Ed. So there were actually receipts that they had. Uh, and he's like holding her waist all creepily. So Ed was an actual pedophile. Ugh. Um, That's not good. Okay, I'm reading this. Hang on. Let me find it. I'm not, there's a lot going on here, guys, so hang on. Okay, here's the addendum. You ready for this? Everyone's, like, weird. <laughs> like, literally. <laughs> it is weird. It's weird. It? it just, did it mess up your perspective on the Warrens? It messed me up. It's, like, really I was messed shocked. me up. Because, like, I love the Warren, or I did love the Warrens. And now I, I read all this, and like, what's going on? Like, everything yeah. I knew isn't now. <laughs> like, literally. Oh, my God. 2021 entering that 5d with the truth you know what so i'm saying this is the addendum this is the addendum that lorraine and her lawyer drew up for warner brothers okay it says this hang on was that you singing okay yes it was <laughs> okay this is called a warren's consulting deal verbatim it is prohibited to have a depiction of Ed Warren or her husband engaging in any of the following crimes, including sex with minors, child pornography, prostitution, sexual assault, or pornography addiction. Neither the husband nor the wife will be depicted participating in any extramarital sexual relationships. They will only be depicted as a proper Catholic couple. Wow. Lorraine wow. is admitting all of, what did I just read? Uh, she's admitting Ed, Ge uh, Ed Gein. She sounds like Whoa. Ed Gein. She's that was weird. Lorraine is admitting her <laughs> own husband is engaging in sex crimes. He's having sex with minors. She's admitting he's into child pornography. She's admitting that he's sleeping with prostitutes. She's admitting that he um, was involved with sexual assault cases. Um, and neither the wife or husband will be depicted having an extramarital sexual relationship. That's the tea. No, oh, no, it's not. We're not done. We're not done with the tea, though. <laughs> The so tea like, continues. It, what do you guys think? I, is that crazy? Is that crazy? I, literally, like, when Crystal and I were chatting about this earlier, I feel like I'm still in a state of processing. So if I look at like I have resting bitch face right now, it's just because I'm processing so still. let me just repeat just, that. Lorraine made Warner woo. Brothers sign that addendum to protect the identity of her husband. Because the truth was coming out. Is that crazy? Yeah. So you have... Yeah. You have Mr. Ed Warren as this, like, proper, perfect paranormal investigator who's, like, of the light and I'm holy and I use the name of God to defeat evil. Why was he so into the devil? Was it because the devil was inside him? Yeah. Was it? Or it was attracted to him. 
Or it was attracted of, to him. Or were the cases and the locations that they were going, they got such good evidence because his energy was so dark? Ooh, Crystal. What? Ooh, you're breaking up. Could you hear what I just said? No, what did you say? I said, was the locations and the um, energy and the um, evidence he was getting so good because he was so dark? Oh, oh gosh, yeah. And in almost every investigation, too, Nikita from said, the Nikita my whole Catholic house is shook it right now. <laughs> <laughs> he always got really affected, too, in these locations, like, right. from an angry standpoint. Yep. You well, know? We're not done so. yet. We're not done yet. We're still not. Mm -hmm. Are we okay? Is everybody okay right now? Can we, we need a going? drink break. Are we good? Do we just New need a, good? like a meditation break? Is everything all right? That's going to okay. sign. We're going to breathe. Know, this is and a lot. This. So, and this is why, you know, Crystal wanted to also make the mention in case Tony does see this. Because oh, this is all this and documented. And I don't, you know It's what? all documented. All he does is threaten and, like, blast people on social media. You know, like, he's a bully. Yeah. He's just a bully. He doesn't want anyone or anything to disrupt the empire that he's swooped in on. His money empire. You know what I mean? Okay, I'm looking through my papers because I don't want to forget anything here. Um, okay, so here's the more tea. So this girl, Judith, was living with the Warrens for 40 years. Okay, so she met age, uh, Ed at the age of 15. Um, and a lot of people accused her of... Um, oh, she said... No, no, that's all right. A lot of people accused her of, like, she was going to sue um, Warner Brothers as well and, like, try to get money off of them because of, like, all of the damages that she'd gone through since she'd been living with them for so many years. And she walked away. She said, my life was already messed up because I was a 15-year-old kid and I was being abused and groomed by Ed for so many years. She got that one syndrome where you, like you're like um you feel bad for your captor type of thing whatever that's why she stayed yeah. so long they gave her so much money they gave her a free house to live they gave her food and in exchange for basically being ed's sex slave in a way she walked away and didn't see she didn't sue warner brothers for a penny not for one penny because she said i knew what happened to me and that was all that mattered he had messed up enough of my life 40 years of my life and i don't need anything else from them She's still alive to this day. She has a lawyer, but apparently she's had no comment for years, and she wants nothing. Yes, Stockholm. Thank you, Monica. She wants nothing to do yes. with the Warrens or their legacy or any of their money. But it's interesting. You hear of Ed and Lorraine being these, oh, beautiful, wonderful Catholic people that did all this stuff. Judith Penny, the girl, also, she's in her 70s now, by the way, she also said that Ed was extremely abusive to Lorraine, and she would witness Ed slapping her constantly. And Ed looked at Lorraine as a business partner. And Ed looked at Judith as his girlfriend. And so he had... Let me give you a timeline. Let me give you a timeline really quickly. Because I actually did the math on the timeline. Okay. May 22nd, 1945 um, is when they got married. She was 18. He was 19. He went into active duty at 17. And at 21, he came home, and this was 1948, and that is when their daughter, Judy, was born. Um, and remember, he was they were both born in the 20s. 15 years later, after the daughter was born, so 1948 is when the daughter's born. 15 years later, that's when he meets Judith um, in 1963, and she's 15 years old, okay? He was 37, and she was 15. He knew Wrong. what he was doing. Yep. He yep. knew what he was doing. She was a, a minor. She probably had a dysfunctional family. Obviously, who's going to let their 15-year-old just move out? You know, he knew to find somebody who was, like, beat down and didn't have anybody. And he put her in a position that she was locked. Then she gets a free house, free food. All I have to do is sleep with the guy. I might as well do it. So bad. So bad. So then she lived with them until 2003, which is interesting. 
So in 2003, Judith ends up getting pregnant by Ed. And Lorraine, now at this point, they'd still had a lot of fame, not the conjuring and stuff, but they'd still had a lot of fame. Lorraine begged Judith to have an abortion because she said it would make the family look bad and it would cause like hysteria in the media. So Lorraine took Judith to get an abortion. And she was so distraught because she said, I'd lived with him for 40 years. He was like my husband, you know, my boyfriend husband. I wanted a child. Why was I not entitled to a child? By the way, at this point, so Ed was like 77 when she got pregnant. So then she, yeah. she was like, I'm done. I'm moving out. She moved out after that. And then three years later, Ed died. She was still in contact with Ed and Lorraine until he passed away she was still a part of their life she just wasn't living with them wow. did your brain just wow. explode like everywhere and i'm sorry but how can wow. they pretend to be this like perfect catholic family when they're they have like some major skeletons in the closet there's always two sides to every story and then there's the truth you know oh my god <laughs> someone said oh my god i need a shower on my brain i know oh my gosh for real though so it, it's shocking it is shocking it is shocking so then you kind of keep watching this documentary, right? And then it goes to a point where Ed's talking about, like, oh, you know, when I figured out my wife was, you know, clairvoyant, the way they would find houses, like locations, is they'd be driving and Lorraine would have visions of, of, of these houses. They'd pull over. Ed would, like, he was an artist. He would draw or do a sketch. And then he would make he's like oh you know Lorraine was this like pretty Irish girl and just everybody loved her he made her go to the front door knock on their house say oh we drove by this house my husband drew this picture for you they would start talking about paranormal and that was their Weasley way they got into paranormal locations Ed was a con man he was an opportunist I'm not saying he wasn't a paranormal investigator. He got some damn good evidence, okay? I'm not disputing that at all. But I'm saying he saw opportunities, and he was an opportunist, and he took them. And at the expense of using his wife for everything, he made Lorraine do all the work. She's the clairvoyant. She's finding the location. She's the one walking up to the front door. And then when they get in media, Ed's the one doing 90% of the talking. Yeah. And he's at home. Nobody knows during this whole frenzy he's got a 15-year-old girlfriend at home that's been living with them for 40 years. Mind-blowing. Now, can I touch on something Please quickly do. on Please the do. clairvoyance thing? Yep. So this is going to kind of jump in the documentary, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to make a note of it that mm -hmm. there was at some point in the documentary where um, Lorraine did get some testing done. To, to see if she actually had uh, clairvoyance, mm -hmm. you know, and was a psychic. And there was a mention in there that um, Lorraine said that she felt less bad about her abilities knowing that there was actual evidence of it. And it makes sense that she would say that not only having grown up in, like, the Catholic school and them kind of telling her, like, don't, don't give in to that type mm -hmm. of thing, but right. also because... It makes sense now um, that Ed was using her as a means of getting to these locations that she would question in her head, is he just using me or do I actually have this ability? Right. right. Like she, how would that not make someone question themselves if they're being used for financial gain? Well, you know what I mean? Here's the damn truth. They were both born in the 20s. Okay. And that yeah. was the era of the 50s, 60s housewife. Yep. And... Ed, if he was controlling and, and if he wanted to have sex and she went to an all-girls school, she's trying to follow her path of the light and God. She doesn't want to sleep with her husband too much because she doesn't want to disappoint God, whatever. Like, you know, that's the scarce of, of religion scaring people. And she mm -hmm. was just trying to do the best she could and be the best person that she could be. Yeah. So if Ed's being abusive or whatever, she's still sticking by her man because that's the ideology of, of the 50s, 60s housewife. 
even if he was abusive that was her man she stuck by her man you you mind your man you walk behind your man in his shadow whatever he wants to do and i'm sorry but like he was really good with words and rhetoric and i wouldn't yeah. doubt that he like talked her into allowing this child to live with them in the name of god god yeah. sent her to me i you can't provide sexual gratification for me so god sent her to me like that's that's cult shit that is yep. cult shit and and Lorraine was very innocent and still trying to obey her husband. And remember, in the eyes of ca of Catholic and Catholicism, you can't get divorced. And if you do get divorced, you can't get remarried in the Catholic Church. Why do I know that? Because I'm obsessed with Gwen Stefani, and she cannot remarry in the Catholic Church with Blake Shelton. She's broken about it because her and Gavin got a divorce. She she's very religious. Her family's religious, and she cannot remarry in the Catholic Church because they won't allow it. Because divorce is frowned upon. You don't do it, yeah. period. Mm -hmm. So, honestly, if Lorraine is old school, she's born in... Just feels like I was getting a shoulder rub for a second. Whoa. Yeah. I you also, I, like, cut out again. I like, thought right. I had a hoodie on my, like, you know, the back of my chair. And it, you know how, like, it feels like when a hoodie falls on you, like, heavy? Yeah. And I turned around and there's nothing there. That's how it felt. It felt like a hoodie, like a blanket floated on me. Someone wearing a hoodie. Ooh. What? What? Isn't the hoodie? What? Didn't I don't you see hoodie. someone wearing a hoodie recently? Who's wearing a hoodie? No, remember, like, a few days ago? I was wearing a hoodie? No, you saw something that was wearing one. Oh, yeah, but that was something That was something else. Something else? Yeah. Something. Oh. I get a lot of energies in here, guys. Sorry, you know. That was Ghost with the Most from last week. So <laughs> another thing that I was interested in was Ed had said in the documentary he was eight years old when he learned about possession and exorcism. Okay. This is weird. I I'm sorry, but, like... He said that his neighbor, he was eight years old, and his neighbor was possessed by um, a demonic pig, and he would lash out and act like a demonic pig. And that his dad or his, like, family got involved, and the neighbors got involved, and they were trying to get somebody to go do, like, a rite of exorcism on him, mm -hmm. and they couldn't do it. And so I, you know, being, like, my little dark side, I got on the internet, and I researched, like, demon names that are pigs. I don't know. I want to know. I want to yeah. know. And you know what comes up? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm not releasing a demonic name, so everybody calm down, okay? You're not supposed to it. say demonic name. I'm not going to do that. But what came up was something called the exorcism of Gerasene demonia, which was something in the Bible. Hmm. And it's a, it's like there's actually mosaics that were that were painted like in AD, and it says it's the swine and the exorcism of legion, and it was miracles that were performed by Jesus in the New Testament. Did Ed make that up from reading the Bible? Oh my gosh! What? That's weird. Did I just like? totally call out ed warren on all his shit and he's like a total fraud wow i mean saying a pig that's very specific yeah and let's be real like back then they didn't like the internet wasn't as prominent so and he is religious clearly so he probably read the new testament it was like you know it would scare people scare the shit out of people more than anything telling him about the exorcism jesus performed on the demonic pig but let's say it was my neighbor. That's messed up. What That's do you messed think? up. Yeah, I agree with that. Anything to kind of zhuzh up, you know, something that he's trying to get notoriety for. That's crazy. I also found it interesting, too, that Ed was always the first one into locations. Something came at my door again. Oh, that was weird. Can I just finish the stream, please? Just, like, let me finish the stream. <laughs> wow. 
Uh, I feel, I swear, I feel like my, my studio is just a portal. And like anytime we, oh my, can I, t one thing off subject really quickly? Yeah. I posted the TikTok of when I was on Instagram and I was like doing the Instagram story and then like the mirror fell and I had all that paranormal activity. Uh-huh. It has like, a, it has like 12,000 views or something ridiculous. Yeah. On TikTok. Um, where, let me see. Let me look. I'm going to look really quick. Hang on. What are we at now? It's at it's at ten thousand views. People are huh. accusing me of it being fake evidence. I am so proud. Do you know what it takes to get to a point where? It, no, I'm serious. I am so oh I'm God. flattered. I am so oh happy. God. Like my evidence was so good, they think it was fake. I'm like so privileged. Like Which some people were like commenting, they're like, "This is fake." I was like. I am so flattered. Thank you so much. Oh like, <laughs> <laughs> While there are like 80 other comments on there that are like, did you see the woman with the black hair? Yeah, that was, I'm that just was like, fucking Pocahontas. She's just chilling in here. My okay. gosh. Um, I'm going to keep going here. So anyway, I, I wrote my last few notes where I think Ed was an opportunist. I do think he was a paranormal investigator. I think he had a lot of skeletons in his, in his closet. You can tell through interviews that he definitely takes over a lot when he's in negotiations with um, Lorraine. He likes to take over the conversation. I am the man, and I have the most to say, and people are going to find me most credible. And Lorraine mm. was a little bit more quiet, and she was like the good Catholic girl, and I'm just sitting here being proper, and I'm just, yes, that's exactly what happened. And now that brings me to Tony Sparrow. Hmm. Here we go. I don't like him. Yeah. I said it. Yeah. Um, Judy, the daughter, does not want to um, have anything to do with, you know, the Warren's legacy. But she married a guy named Tony, who, as we all know, has taken over most of the Warren's legacy, not by blood. And we all know the public fight that Zach had with him last fall, right? So mm -hmm. you give me your two cents because you've met Tony in person. You have shook his hand. You've taken photos with him. You've met Annabelle. You um, tell me, you, you go first. You, you give me your insight between who you saw in person versus him throwing absolute hysterical, obnoxious, childish fits online. Yeah, it's really funny because um, when I was sitting down and watching the documentary and even like his interview footage, his persona on his interview is not what he's like in person. Um, in person, he's very like kind of like what I've said before. He's a very uh, forceful guy. He's very um, by forceful. I just mean like with his words, like a lot of people really listen to him. He, he um, is very captivating. He knows how to captivate his audience and. I don't think in a very good way. Um, he's a very, he's a very. I'm just gonna put a little ooh. spice right there. Not in a good way, by the way. And not in a good way. And uh, he does not look at anybody when he talks to them. Ooh, I don't trust a mofo who doesn't look me in the eyes. Okay. Yeah. So when we when we d talked after the Annabelle, um, you know the Annabelle event, whatever, he would not look at me. Hmm. So wait, look okay, me. tell me like what you you're shaking his hand. You're like, oh hi, I'm Cat from Ghost Girl Diaries. Oh, nice to meet you. And he, mm -hmm. where's he looking? Like, what's what's the conversation like? He was looking down uh, at the floor, and mm. he was like pushing his ear towards me, kind of like he couldn't hear me. But there were a lot of people that had left the event um, after the black cloth was taken off the Annabelle doll because people were feeling very sick. Mm -hmm. um, so there weren't a ton of people in this like super small room. <laughs> yeah. um, and, but he, um, he talked with me about like intention. I, I'll, I'll be honest, like I don't even really remember the question that I asked him, but he told me that intent is everything. Mm -hmm. And that if you have bad intent doing something, then, you know, there's going to be consequences for that. But if you have good intent and you're, you know, doing something for good or whatever, um, you know, then good comes from that. Do you think that just, he is mimicking Ed Warren's personality? 100%. They, they, based off of, like, hearing the tapes and how it was Whoa, portrayed. Nikita because had just said at the same time, almost yeah. like Tony's the new Ed, right as we said he that. Is. 
I had actually talked about that with Crystal earlier. I said, I think that Tony is literally ident- identical to Ed because Ed taught him everything. Tony was actually a, a skeptic. Um, and he, maybe he still is. Maybe he's putting up an act. Like, who knows the actual truth anymore, you know? Um, $1.7 million said, dollars in assets will do a lot of talking, you know what I'm saying? No kidding. Well, he... Um, you know, he told us in the, the room that we were in, because it was like a three-hour event with him showing us, like, videos and tapes of, like, exorcisms and things like that, um, that he kept talking about himself a lot. And he was saying things like, you know, I used to be a skeptic until Tony, like, brought me onto these investigations, and then I believed. Like, I, you know, it's very real, yada, yada. Um, but I have him on, I used to have him on Facebook. We were Facebook friends for a while. And, um... I, I was very creeped out by some of the things that he would post on there because um, he would do lives a lot with Annabelle. Like, he would be in the Wait, occult I'm sorry. museum. Wait a second. So you're saying that he had to, Zach had to pay him thousands of dollars to bring a doll across the United States. He had yeah. to buy a first class ticket for him and the doll, a seat by for the doll itself. Um, he had to pay for everything first class, and he says that the doll is dangerous and he doesn't want anyone around it, yet he will do videos and Facebook Lives with the doll? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Sounds like and what's even, what's even creepier is, like, it almost doesn't seem, like, he almost kind of seems like he's a little trancy when he goes on these lives, because sometimes he, he would go on, and it would just be of him and Annabelle, and there would be no other lights on but this, like, glowing red light. Which I would assume is like the museum, the alarm light or something or whatever. You know what I mean? Like it was just glowing red, and it's literally of him just like staring at the camera with Annabelle behind him. Doing what? Just sitting there? In just silence? standing there in front of the camera, and it would literally be like that to the point where he was star- standing there and staring for so long. I would think like the the frame froze or something, and it was of him like trancing out. And then like three minutes later, he would say things like, "I'm with the Annabelle doll right now." And yada, yada, yada. And then I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> like, I'm done now. You know, like, he's crow. You keep telling people to not challenge this thing. You keep doing, like, prayers during your events and things like that. But you're going to sit here and do lives with so her, like, every other his day? personality fluctuates? Is that what you're trying to say? Oh, yeah. Like, I have, I have no doubt in my mind that Annabelle really affects him. Because of the way that she really affects a lot of people. And she does put people in a weird, trancy state mm-hmm. a lot. It's happened to me, too. And, um... It's just very interesting. It's he's, So how he's, do you feel about his combativeness publicly fighting with Zach? Oh, it's childish. I think that he has a really big ego. And I think that when he doesn't have all the facts or he thinks somebody else is not being honest or whatever, he goes on an ego trip because he has to always be right. And um, he acts like a child. That That whole thing with Zach was absolutely unprofessional completely unprofessional Mm -hmm. especially if you're gonna sit there and represent ed and lorraine warren you know before this information what do you think about about him uh well yeah what do you think about the legacy behind the warrens how do you what do you think he's done to the legacy with the warrens uh he's taken the pretty dollar I also found it not um, not surprising at all that towards the end of the documentary, he stated that shortly after Ed died, he got a call from Hollywood. Uh-huh. I think there are no coincidences. Mm-hmm. I think that Lorraine at that point was tired, um, especially after Ed passing away. And maybe there is a sense of relief with that. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, who knows? Um, and she didn't know what to expect. Mm-hmm. And she trusted Tony because Tony and Ed were like two peas in a pod. Mm-hmm. And Ed took the money and the legacy for the dollar. Or you mean Tony? And uh, yeah, to- did I say Ed? Yeah. Oh, that was weird. Well, they're, um, they're so like identical. That's why. They, they are. And he even had his own chair on set. He would take like selfies. Like I would go through his profile and like he had pictures on set and pictures on the red carpet. And it's like. So you're afraid to, like, bring the doll out, but you're okay with them not telling the full story in all of these other franchises? Like, I don't understand. It just doesn't make sense. There's no consistencies with anything. So I think that's why he gets triggered when people call him out or ask questions, which is totally okay, by the way. 
Like, it's okay to ask questions and wonder why, you know, things are the way they are, why he's not consistent with the things he says, but he gets triggered by that Mm -hmm. because he expects people to follow him and believe every word he says. Mm -hmm. So it's just part of that narcissism. Manipulation, narcissism, extreme narcissism. I feel, yeah, I feel bad for Judy and I feel bad for Lorraine. Rest her soul. Rest her soul. Mm -hmm. She was still alive when I went to the event um, and she died like a few days after. Right, that's weird, isn't the it? Event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very peacefully from what you know, was said, but well, um, yeah, sad. I don't have any more tea, guys. That I mean, that was a lot of tea. Yeah. So okay, so let's both give some final thoughts on what we feel about the Warrens. I'm gonna go first. Okay. I loved the Warrens. I grew up as everyone has idolizing them. I still. I think, you know, Lorraine's absolutely clairvoyant. I think she's absolutely gifted. You can see it in the videos that she's doing in the interaction. I believe her. As far as Ed goes, I mean, I think he was a businessman. I think he was a businessman. I think the only thing that he could contribute was capturing evidence on camera. But I kind of think other than that, and, and I, I believe what he captured was real. So I'm not disputing the pe- you know paranormal evidence that he captured but I think he was a businessman I think he was an opportunist for sure I think he found an opportunity he could slide his way in I've always thought that about Ed but on the flip side I didn't know about all of this scandal that went on in the court system um, with Hollywood and Warner Brothers until today and uh, it gave me a completely different view on the Warrens I feel really really bad for Lorraine you know obviously why would you why would you put that stuff in court like they interviewed the woman that was the child you know like in court like this stuff happened guys like it happened it's in the court documents and it's just sad it's sad because then like now Ed's like image to me is completely tarnished and I'm kind of sitting here laughing at full circle because you have Tony who's an ass and he's made himself an ass publicly He's defending a legacy of Ed who now has a horribly tarnished viewpoint on his soul and what he did while he was on this planet. So I don't know if Tony should be, you know, following those footsteps because now he kind of looks like an idiot too. So I love Lorraine. Bless her soul. I hope to God that she got peace and I hope that Ed heals. And by the way... Ed was in a really bad boating accident. He talked about that. He was in World War II, which was the Nazi era. He said that he was um, in this boating accident in the Navy. He's a veteran. He fell in the water, the icy waters of the Atlantic. There was a gasoline fire that was surrounding him. He said he said the uh, Mary prayer, the Mary mother prayer, and that the fire split in two and went around them, and it was um, it opened up for a lifeboat to come in and rescue him and his friend. That was his near-death experience. Then he said he took survivor's leave, which I don't know what that is, and I'm very well-versed in military terms. So, in fact, I made a call to see if they knew what that, people I know knew what that was, and they don't. So it must have been something from the past. This was before shell shock or PTSD was a thing. So, God only knows, did Ed hit his head when he fell in the water? He was put on survivor's leave and then went back into the military. Did he hurt his head? Did he have mental illness? Did he have a traumatic brain injury? Did he have, so that's a TBI, did he have PTSD, did he have shell shock, did he have bipolar, schizophrenia, something other than, you know, what was, what, what was happening? Is, is the untreated mental illness, what is, not that I'm excusing pedophilia, but like, he wasn't treated, obviously, he was in a bad accident, and they didn't believe in helping soldiers at that time, it's still like pulling teeth to get help for a veteran. So I'm just saying there's a lot more to this story that we're never going to know. They both took it to the grave. And uh, I do know for a fact after reading those documents, I incur, let me actually, go ahead, Kat, you do yours. I'm going to, I'm going to post some articles in here so that you guys can access them right now. Go ahead, Kat. Okay. Yeah, I think just to piggyback off of Crystal, no pun intended, um, (laughs) that I... I don't like we we aren't saying this that to say that they didn't have an impact on the paranormal community. You know, like we know that they did and the things that they did were incredible. 
you know. Um, but there are no coincidences. And to be honest, like everything kind of makes sense now. I don't know if either Ju Judy, maybe Judy didn't have an idea of what was going on. But if she did, maybe that's why she's not a part of the legacy as much. And Tony kind of took control over it. Um, I love Lorraine and I do love Judy. Um, and it's really sad that these things have happened. And I think as somebody else who really looked up to like Ed and Lorraine and their legacy and the things that they did for their community in like New England area, um, and especially being from New England, you know, it hit me really hard hearing all of this information because I almost feel like I'm kind of mourning everything I thought I knew mm -hmm. about the Warrens. And that's really difficult. And, um, you know, the truth comes out at some point and it's a shame. It's a shame that this is what it's about. Mm -hmm. It's a shame. I, I feel so bad for Lorraine. Um, now, you can do more digging than the articles I posted, but I don't, I, I didn't even finish going through court documents. I couldn't. It, there's so many. But yeah. literally hours. I was supposed to finish the um, documentary and rewatch it today, and I was literally looking through court documents all day. But these yeah. are some articles. Now, Hollywood Reporter is really good. That's a big um, company that filmmakers follow, and they basically will take contracts and, like, pick them apart. You know what I mean? Like, so they were talking about the actual contract that Laura, uh, Lorraine had made with Warner Brothers. Because an affidavit isn't uncommon, but an affidavit that says you will not depict my husband as a sexual predator, that's uncommon. Okay? Like, that you don't hear of. So it's just messed up. It's just messed up. And it's sad. And it is sad. I wonder how much that author got from Warner Brothers. Yeah. It was probably a lot. Yeah. It's just sad. It's just, it's really sad. I just feel like I'm kind of mourning everything at yeah, this point. I'm going to that, a that's... funeral today. I'm sorry, guys. I know. <laughs> well, yeah. That's all I've got. That was a lot of tea. I don't have, I don't have any else. That was too much tea. That was a lot of tea that in was, a stream. I was, a lot of people weren't going to expect that. You know what I mean? Like, you guys are probably like, what did I just watch? I like, coming in hot. Nikita said something so funny earlier. She said, you've officially made it, Crystal. We bow down to you. <laughs> Look, okay, I just try to find the truth, and there's a lot of people that don't want to know the truth. Yeah. They don't. People don't want to know, like, the, you know, that could just destroy someone's image. Um, that they, you know, they idolize Ed, and, and like, that's going to destroy their idol. You know what I mean? Yeah. Woo! Yeah. It's so bad. You know, that's... It's a lot. It's a lot to take in. A lot to take in. But you guys should watch the documentary. Yep. And just to see for yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, let us know your take on it too. I totally. Because I think agree. we'd like to to know. Yeah. So next week I'm going to be talking about an asylum with Seth. So make sure you guys turn in tune in for that. The that's going to be a good one. Week, um, is the third week of um. January is when Elfie is going to come on with me. So Elfie and I have been talking about streaming together for so long. Thank you, Laura, for the cheers. We appreciate you. Um, Elfie has been uh, wanting to do streams with me for a while. So we're going to talk together about the Black Dahlia and Slender Man. So that's the, uh, the tea for the rest of the month. And then the following week, which is the fourth week, Kat and I are going to talk about female cult leaders. Ooh. It's going to be real good. That's it's going to be, be real good, good, guys. And then the following week after that, Elfie will be back on, and we're going to talk about HP Lovecraft and uh, Necronomicon. So yeah. I'm really excited yeah. to have um, Elfie in on this, too. So it'll be good. Um, it's going to be In the great. next 60 days... I should know if I can release the Ghost Girl Diaries pilot on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So I, Kat's like, mm, I'm waiting. Mm -hmm, I'm waiting. <laughs> so yeah, in the next 60 days, um, the pilot itself is not going to get signed to a series. Like if, if a series gets signed, we're going to have to reshoot everything. So I am going to take that one and I am going to release it for you guys on Amazon. A lot of people wanted me to release it on YouTube, and here's why I'm not going to. I need some money back. 
I'm gonna be honest. It cost it cost your girl a lot of money to make that thing, and uh, it hurt when Chanel left financially. And I need some money back from it. I don't get a lot of money back from Amazon because they take royalties, and so I end up making sort of pennies on the dollar. But something's better than nothing. So yes, I am going to be releasing that, probably for not more than like five or ten dollars. So it's not going to be out of this world. Um, mm -hmm. And then another thing that I'm going to be releasing, hopefully in the next week, I'm reformatting my ebook, and so I'm hoping that will be released in both print and ebook format on Amazon as well. Yay! And it's that exciting. Is the Mofo T. Okay. That was a lot, like when I started finding the, those documents, I was like, oh my God, I have to go through all of these, like it's so bad. <laughs> Went down a dark rabbit hole, uh, well, putting the puzzle I pieces together. More, and then I'm like, she was pregnant, like what, you know what I mean? I'm like, what? Plot twist. Because I'm like, there's <laughs> supposed to be this like perfect Catholic family. How did he get a 15 year old girl to live with them? And like, why was Lorraine okay with him? having interact sexual interaction with a 15 year old girl and she knew it and then i'm like then she like re does this affidavit with the production company and i'm like what is going on yeah yeah talk about bringing in 2021 it's coming in hot yeah We're coming in hot yeah 5d <laughs> level up something <laughs> jeez something thank you guys so much for tuning in today i appreciate you oh uh one more thing i'd love to to give put out there I have decided I'm going to make one attempt at reviving the old ghost girl diaries channel I'm gonna make one attempt at it and the attempt is this I'm gonna be downloading this video in the next day and I'm gonna upload this video to the old YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash ghost girl diaries, all one word, okay? What my plan is, I've heard through the grapevine that if your, if your channel has been, you know, with a shadow and then later with a ban, I can't say those <laughs> words together. Yes. I have heard that if you promote a video using YouTube Google ads, it will take your channel out of a ban and then again once with a shadow, okay? I have heard that. I don't <laughs> know if it's going to work, okay? But I'm going to try. So I would love it if you guys could make sure you're still subscribed to the old channel watch for notifications and when it's uploaded if you can see it i would love if you could go comment on it even if you're like hey what's up or like like it i just want to see if you guys can see it do you see what i'm saying i just want to yes. see if you guys can yes. see it and then tweet at me or like message me on instagram you know what i mean like yes it's there yet yeah, no it's not there because i i'm then i'm gonna put it in a google ad and as a tempt to revive it. There are no promises. We're going to see what happens. Because what I heard was if you pay YouTube to or Google to promote it, they will take it out of that status. We'll see. A certain status. We'll, a certain yeah, shadowy we that. status. We also don't say the, the name Paul with a low and a gain. You know what I'm saying? We don't say yeah. that together. We, don't, mm -mm. we also don't say... Forests that do something when you accidentally kill yourself. We don't say that well, either. Although, no. I do have some tea about that. What? There may or may not be a certain court case going on where a certain someone is finally getting sued. What? Yep. By who? Uh, someone. YouTube someone. or somebody else? Someone outside of YouTube. In the United States or in Japan? United States. With the low to the pollen? Yes. Like okay. the allergies. You know what I'm saying? He is an yeah, allergy. I'm... He's an infection. <laughs> he is Rona. He's like a virus. He's he a virus. He infected the whole paranormal community. Like, literally. Yeah, I'm going to find the... I'll find the article and post it. And see what you guys think. Uh, yeah, I need to see that. Yeah. Tea. 
So anyway, I'll send it. We'll cross your fingers. If it revives, we're gonna go back to that. Which I am gonna start doing uploads. If it if it revives, if it doesn't revive, I've already made another channel. So anyway, yeah, that's sure. the tea. <laughs> Covered all bases. I'm, just, I'm, I'm ready to go. You know, it's like 2021. <laughs> Let's go. Like drop everything. Go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god thank you guys so much it. for tuning in please make sure you subscribe to our twitch channel please make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel also please make sure you follow us everywhere on social media we are everywhere look for crystal leandra ghost girl diaries and cat cormier um we'll see you guys next week friday same time and as always i will catch you guys next time next time bye guys bye